Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Rick Martin. I'm the uh, acting president of the Brookhaven Chamber of Commerce. Um, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with us, we are a um, politically independent, financially independent organization here in Brookhaven, uh, comprised of members of the business community. Our mission is to uh, support businesses, uh, help educate them about uh, things that are going to affect them in the community, and we do that by hosting events like this. Uh, we do we do networking functions, luncheons. Uh, we help facilitate navigating uh, city hall uh, permitting and licensing and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, check us out on Facebook or, or any of the social media or our webpage. We also have an office uh, just off of Peachtree on Dresden and Apple Valley. Feel free to drop by. We're always looking for volunteers if you'd like to get involved in the community a little more. Uh, we'll be opening up a couple of board seats in the fall as well, and we'd love to have you uh, talk to us about that as well. A um, couple quick thank yous, and we'll kick it off. Uh, certainly thank the candidates, J. Max Davis and Taylor Bennett, and your teams for coming. We know how busy you are with the election next week. I um, wanted to thank Terrell Karstens for all the work she did to get this organized. The event is being videotaped by the Brookhaven Post, so you'll be able to watch it again online uh, or tell your friends to go watch it. Um, I'm going to introduce Todd Lantier next. He is our founder and uh, will be hosting and moderating tonight. He's done a number of these, so he'll talk about uh, the format of the debate, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Rick. I wanted to personally thank Rick for putting this event together. He and Terrell and Mary Ellen and Mike, and if I miss anybody else, did a fantastic job of organizing this. Uh, we tried to get one done before, and trying to get everyone in the room at the same time is kind of it's not that easy. So if I'm missing anyone, um, just thanks everyone for had, so, had an opportunity to participate. First housekeeping issue, cell phones, turn them off. That always happens. That includes the candidates. Uh, that's embarrassing. Uh, second thing is uh, the, the, the how we're going to do it tonight, five-minute open intro. So each candidate's going to have five minutes to introduce themselves. And then we have several questions. We had 30-something questions submitted. There were certain themes that became very, very evident. So some of the questions are going to fall into certain categories. The candidates have had an opportunity to become aware of what those questions are going to generally be looking like about a half hour, an hour ago. So they're not prepared responses. Um, they will have three minutes to respond. There will be no rebuttals. Okay, that will take up way too much time. I think that fundamentally there will be a lot of back and forth on the, uh, they're both attorneys and they will be debating. And it will be here all night. So um, the invitation goes out to you to contact the um, campaign managers, Robert Sills in the back. Robert, if you would wave for Taylor and Mr. Goldsmith? Gabe Sterling. Gabe, God, Gabe Sterling. Gabe, where are you, Gabe? Is he here? Not here. Contact uh, my website for any questions. Mr. Davis's campaign. They will be referred to as Mr. Bennett, Mr. Davis. Or Elizabeth Dewberry here. Oh, Elizabeth? Okay, so you can go and talk to Elizabeth. Um, very, very quickly, uh, I know we have two elected officials in the back from Shambly. We have Tom Hogan, city councilman, Brian Mott from Shambly, city councilman. Is there anybody else that I have missed, elected officials? Thank you for your service. Quick survey, show of hands. Who lives in Sandy Springs? Okay, who lives in Brookhaven? Okay, it's a lot of Brookhaven people. Who lives in Doraville? Who lives in unincorporated DeKalb? Who lives outside the, uh, the voting district? Shambly. Oh, Shambly, sorry. I live outside the voting district, that's why I'm able to moderate. Um, so with that being said, I am going to pass the mic. We would like to do a hard stop at 8. If we have some extra time, we might allow for some questions, but I, I believe we're going to go right up until 8, all right? We had a coin toss, and to see who could go first, Mr. Davis won the coin toss, so he is going to take his five minutes, and Rick is going to keep time and keep us on time. So Mr. Davis, if you would. Yes, thank you to the Chamber. I'm going to stand up just for the opening statement, but I'm going to sit down. I just told Taylor that's what we could do, it, so I'm not going to be a bunch of sitting and standing. I just want to thank the Chamber for hosting this debate. Todd, of course, Mr. Martin, Taylor, everybody with the Chamber. Also want my family to please stand up. I want to thank them because this has been a long and arduous campaign, and this is my wife. <laughs> that's Liza, my wife Carrie, Lydia, and Max, and my mother-in-law and stepfather-in-law. Sherry and Dave Felton. 
Uh, thank you all for coming, all you citizens and residents of the area. Uh, did anybody, anybody from Shambly here? I know Tom Hogan's here. Okay, because that was, uh, we got a few, good. Um, <laughs> hey, um, listen, I am very excited about the opportunity that's being presented before me this coming Tuesday. And you have an opportunity as well to make your voice heard. The reason I'm running for the state house seat is because I want to continue the positive momentum that I helped start as mayor of Brookhaven. In Brookhaven, we were able to pave more roads in two years than the county was able to do in about a decade. Build more sidewalks in two and a half years than the county was able to do in about a decade. We also took on a stormwater system that was decrepit and decay with a zero balance. Now it has a million dollars to handle maintenance and infrastructure repair. We cut permit wait times down significantly. We improved our parks. When we inherited uh, the parks from DeKalb County, the budget that DeKalb County was spending on all of our parks, all, tw all 12 of them, or 13 depending on your count, uh, was $400,000. Uh, as of this year, we will have spent $4 million in just two years on infrastructure improvements in our parks. If you remember what it looked like three years ago when you would go to a DeKalb County Park, uh, what we found was the, the pump, the pool pump at Murphy Candler Pool was on the jack. There were cracks in the deck. The parks weren't being maintained with their grass. There were no really benches or swings to speak of. Hard pan dirt everywhere. Playground equipment for the most part in disrepair. And there was just no maintenance and upkeep. We were, we've been able to transform our parks. We've got a lot more work to do in just two and a half years, or really two years. Uh, but the most significant thing that was the reason for my desire to form a city was the lack of security and protection for the families in, in, in Brookhaven and our community. It was extremely important that we didn't have to deal with calling 911 and getting an answering machine or getting put on hold. Waiting for a police officer, officer to arrive when your home or your, your car was broken in, it'd be an hour or so. Now, I think everybody would agree, even my opponent, that the security situation in Brookhaven is dramatically different. Now we have quadrupled police coverage from what we had before. We did all those things and more, and now have the lowest millage rate in DeKalb County. They said you can't do it without raising taxes. They said you couldn't do it without declining services. The opposite is true. We now have a community that is being served by its local government, and I'm very proud of the accomplishments that I made as mayor of Brookhaven. And I'm proud of you as citizens for being involved in supporting that as well. So when you hear tonight some of the issues that come up, keep in mind the record that I put, posted as Mayor Brookhaven and the things that you're now enjoying that you just you weren't enjoying two and a half years ago. So look forward to the lively debate, and I ask for your support on August 11th. Thank you. I would just like to thank everybody again uh, on behalf of everyone up here for putting this on. This is something we were trying to get done in the first half of this election and we just couldn't get it done. But uh, this is really kind of what the fun part about these campaigns are, is getting everybody together, hearing the issues and having some good dialogue. Um, some of you I've met, a lot of you I've met, uh, we've been walking the streets since day one. But uh, for those of you who have not had an opportunity, uh, I have not had the opportunity to meet yet, just a little bit about who I am and, and how I'm even standing on this stage. but. Uh, I grew up really in central Illinois. Uh, we moved to St. Louis for high school, uh, and then I ended up coming down here uh, to attend Georgia Tech. I was recruited to play quarterback for the Yellow Jackets to play under Chan Gailey. Um, and, and in the first five minutes of being in Atlanta, I fell in love with the city and realized that this is really the place I wanted to call home. Uh, and I've been here ever since. Uh, tried to play professional football a little bit, realized that career was going nowhere and fast, uh, and so hung up my cleats. and. Uh, actually uh, enrolled in John Marshall Law School uh, right here in Midtown. Uh, I went to part-time night school and worked full-time you know, throughout the day. And, uh, after law school, I started practicing uh, employment law. And that's really what I do now is I, um, a lot of my practice is focused on representing uh, employees and, and labor disputes, uh, but also representing small businesses uh, and incubating businesses to get you know, them on the right track and guiding them on, on how to set up their companies and, and where to go with things. Um, and, and that's been a really rewarding career so far. I found a lot of, um, you know, uh, I guess a lot of happiness in what I'm able to do for an individual that's been discriminated against. Uh, but at the same time, I'm kind of also on the other side of this and uh, helping businesses and helping our economy grow uh, and figuring out how we can uh, make a, a more meaningful impact. 
Uh, but this past spring, uh, you know, I was you know, kind of sitting here and kind of looking at what the legislature was doing, uh, you know, as a whole and saying that we were, in my opinion, kind of headed towards a of a, a dark road on what we were trying to get done legislatively, uh, and it really didn't sit right with me. And uh, and so I saw this opportunity. Uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to throw my hat in the ring. Uh, I really wanted to make a meaningful impact uh, on some things that I believe are, are headed in the wrong direction. Uh, and so I put my name, uh, you know, down on the ballot, and and we are here today. And, and I, I can't tell you how exciting uh, this is is to be in this position. Uh, but also how uh, incredible it's been to meet everybody, uh, you know, in the Sandy Springs, Shambly, and the Brookhaven communities. Uh, I think that's one of the most uh, rewarding parts about this, is being able to come to your homes and sit in there and, and drink some coffee uh, and, and talk about the issues that we face every day. Um, and that's really been the most rewarding part. So I really thank everybody uh, for, for, for allowing us to have that opportunity. And I hope we can get something out of this tonight, uh, and then we can all go to the polls on Tuesday. So thank you. Thank you very much. Am I, am I correct? You both went to the same law school? Yes. So when they talk about how exciting politics is, this, this is excitement. No? Both went to, no? Okay. All right. So what do I have a minute for, uh, to ask it, and they've got three minutes to answer it, and they're each going to do it, and Mr. Davis goes first, correct? I'll look first on the speech. All right, so we're going to let Mr. Bennett answer here. first. So, uh, first topic, generally, uh, question. Uh, obviously, education is a very hot topic right now with the reintroduction of the HR 4 bill to create more local school districts. Charter schools and taxpayer savings accounts are also being evaluated in HD 80. What is your position on decentralizing and improving our schools, and how would you fund these improvements? Thank you. Um, I believe that the education of our children is probably the single most important issue that we face as a society. Um, you've probably heard a lot in this election so far that I'm nothing but for the status quo, uh, and that's just simply not true. I wouldn't be in this race if that were the case. Uh, but what I can tell you what has been status quo in Georgia for the past 12 years uh, is the systematic underfunding of education by over $8 billion. Uh, and that's essentially what our, our lawmakers have done over the past 12 years. Uh, another topic that has come up in this, uh, in this election so far is revisiting you know, the QBE, which is the formula that we use to fund education. Uh, that formula has been intact for, for quite a while now, but our legislature has not abided by it one time. Uh, and we systematically defund education every, year by year. Uh, and that's just unacceptable. Um, and, and, and here's why. Uh, for the obvious reasons that we, we need to have the funding in place to provide the resources and tools to our teachers and our students uh, to achieve the levels that we actually set for them. I, and I don't think that there's a parent in this room that has children in school that would be comfortable with underfunding their children's education. I know I wouldn't be. Uh, but we, we have to invest in it if we're going to ask our children to also be invested in it. Uh, and, and looking back at the QBE, I'm all for revisiting the QBE formula and making sure that uh, we're spending money effectively and efficiently in the system. Uh, I don't want another dollar wasted either, uh, but that certainly doesn't mean that we're going to rob the Children's Education Fund to pay for something else. Um, you know, and something else that has come up specifically to, to House, you know, Bill 4 is this independent school district uh, that's, that's floating around, this idea. Um, you've probably also heard that I'm, I'm the one thing stopping this thing from happening, and that's just simply not true. And I've never been opposed to that, uh, that proposition once, and I've been open uh, about my support for that if that's what the people want. Uh, but what goes into that is, is a very long process. It requires a constitutional amendment which means that two-thirds of the House and Senate and the majority of the voters have to decide for that. That's a long road to take. And it's already been put down twice in the legislature. And there's a reason for that. is because there are Republicans in the legislature that don't want that bill. This would kill county and rural areas of Georgia that need to actually have consolidated schools to be able to maintain the funding levels that give the resources and tools of those schools to succeed. And that's something that really is hindering that bill. It's not that the Democrats, you know, are fighting against it. It's, that it's actually, realistically, it's not the best thing for Georgia as a whole. And it, it may be something that's good for here, but I think that people need to understand all the facts that go into this issue before we start 
parading around this idea that sounds really nice because if we create an independent school district here in Brookhaven or any of the municipalities in the, in the metro city area, the responsibility goes on the taxpayers to fund that initiative. Your property taxes will be affected by that. You cannot cap property taxes then add a school system in there and expect your property taxes to go down. Those are mutually exclusive in and of themselves. So as your representative, I want to make clear that I'm not against any initiative to, to reform education at, at every level. Uh, and I will work every day to ensure that our education, the education of our children is the first and foremost priority uh, for our state for our state policymakers. And as your representative, I promise you that I will make that my point. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Rick, can you hold that sign up? Yeah. We got a one minute mark and then an X, and the X means you're done. So we need to be cognizant of that, if you would please. All right. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank you, Todd. Yes. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, with all due respect, Taylor, um, your thoughts on this issue and the machinations of how we could get a school, city school district are really an older way of thinking. Um, the, the bill that's currently pending before the legislature, was, which was introduced in its current form for the first time last year, takes that rural element you're talking about out of the, 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 question, out of the equation. The bill now says it only applies to school systems that were cities that were, applied, that were created after the year 2004 and neighboring cities. So that would apply to about 10 cities in the metro area, not the rural districts. That was why the bill was changed to make sure that we didn't have a problem with the rural legislators having opposition to it, about them being nervous about a city in their rural county taking all the funds away and taking all the best students. So that issue has been dealt with us in this bill. And I know it, it is a, a hard road to, to get this bill done. Uh, and the, the point about my vote in the legislature it would be 119, and there are Republicans who are okay with the bill now because it's, it's been changed. It is. It does depend on the, the swing in the legislature. Uh, the, the, when you talk about funding for our schools, you're talking about state funding and how the QBE, it, it does need reform, it does need, it need to be machinated, needs to be replaced in some areas, but you have school systems that are very successful because they have successful county school uh, districts. Gwinnett County and Cobb County are prime exa examples. They're dealing with the QBE formula, but because the control of the schools is, doesn't really come from the state, it comes from your local school system. And right now, we're dealing with the Cobb County school system. It doesn't matter, in, in some terms, how much money we're getting from the state. It matters how your tax dollars and my tax dollars are being spent by the Cobb County bureaucrats. That's the problem. We have a school system in DeKalb County laden with bureaucrats not doing anything to educate a child in a classroom. My wife is a teacher at Kitchener Magnet School. She tells me every day how bad decisions from government officials and Democrats affect her job in the classroom. And that's the problem. The state, yeah, we can work on QBE, but we need to work on DeKalb County. We are saddled with a system that, I don't know if you lived here then, but we were threatened with losing our accreditation just a couple years ago. The governor had to fire our school board. The state did something for us. They fired our school board. It's all about how our DeKalb bureaucracy is wasting funds and not educating children. That's what it's about. That's why my passion for a new city school system that separates us from that, that central office down there is so important to me. It's for my children, your children, and your grandchildren. That's why I'm in this race, because we need better educational options for our children. Everybody in Brookhaven from top to bottom not just the people who have kids that can go to Montgomery or Asher Park, but for the kids that go to Woodward and Montclair. That's the issue, and DeKalb County is responsible for that disparity, not the state of Georgia. And I want to use my position as legislator to change that, not do the same old things and worry about money, money, money. It's not about money in DeKalb County. DeKalb County spends almost, spends more than just about any other district in the state with some of the worst results, DeKalb County and state of Atlanta. Those are the two systems that spend the most per student. So let's stop thinking about money and let's start thinking about how we change the dynamic that's been going on in DeKalb County that's, that is hurting our children and robbing our children of a quality education. Thank you for your response. No, I think we, both candidates went over on that first round, so we're even, okay? The X is done. All right. We're going to turn the mic off if uh, we have to. All right. I only see that nicely. Okay. Uh, the next question is about money, by the way. <clears throat> Redevelopment powers and, and TADs, tax anticipation uh, districts or tax allocation districts. Redevelopment powers are allowed in Sandy Springs and Shambly. They were defeated at the polls last year in Brookhaven by a significant margin. 
If elected, will you introduce redevelopment powers and what do you feel is the government's role in funding private development? No, I will not be carrying any legislation to introduce redevelopment powers for the city of Brookhaven or any other city. Other, most cities have it, but no, I will not be doing that. I think we've got uh, a lot of things on our plate now. I wasn't for it when it went on the ballot last time. I, it wasn't my decision. But government does play a role in making sure that the climate in your jurisdiction is facilitating the free market. So when I talk, when I talk about what we did in Brookhaven, that's why businesses are coming here. That's why we have the lowest unemployment rate in the metro area, the city of Brookhaven does now. That was just released a couple weeks ago. It's because they know when they come to Brookhaven, when they want to get a business permit, Brookhaven is going to efficiently go over their application and is going to issue that permit in a timely manner. I'll give you a little story. When we were a smash, the restaurant over here at Town Brookhaven, they were excited that they were, came here just as we became a city. They were excited about opening up a business. They were building their, their restaurant out. They were almost done, and then the Cab County Fire Marshal came in and said, nope, you got to do it this way, you can't do it that way, because the previous inspection was a different to Cab County Fire Marshal. We were having issues with businesses not being able to open because the Cab County Fire Marshal's office was holding up their permits and their, to get a CO. And I got a call from the owner of, of Smash, Tom Catherall, and he said, Mr. Mayor, we want to open up in your city. Your permitting process was a breeze. We got everything we needed to get done, but we're being held up because the DeKalb County Fire Marshal either misses his appointments or we're getting a different read every time, we, every time one of them shows up. So what did we do in the city of Brookhaven? We got our own fire marshal. Problem eliminated. So that's how government can facilitate business. That's the job of, of responsible government. And the leadership we showed in Brookhaven with paving our roads and sidewalks, yeah, those are important to businesses too. The police presence is hugely important to our businesses. If you don't have a safe city and a safe, safe streets, nobody's going to want to come here. So what's good for businesses is also good for homeowners. And homeowners, that's why the home values are rising steadily in Brookhaven. That's why businesses are continuing to come here. That's why our unemployment rate is low, because our, our millage rate for homeowners is very low. Also, our business uh, property tax rate is the lowest in DeKalb County. Businesses know that. So when you think about what business can do to help, uh, what, what government can do to help businesses, it's those things. It's making sure that they have a competent, efficient government keeping their back. And that's what it's about. So the redevelopment power laws. Uh, this legislation is a tool that municipalities can use uh, to help, you know, centralize the autonomy to make developmental decisions at the local level. Uh, as you mentioned, Todd, the people of Brookhaven voted, I think 60 percent of the people of Brookhaven voted against that, uh, you know, when it came up for a referendum vote. Um, now while tools like this uh, can be beneficial for one area, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for another area or that the people want it for another area. Uh, but recently, uh, you know, actually the city of Roswell went through this as well. Uh, but the two years leading up to the vote on the redevelopment powers referendum in Roswell, the city took initiative to educate the voters on what exactly they were getting into before it went to a vote. Um, and what the city here in Brookhaven proposed, uh, you know, was very not open and transparent. Uh, and so actually I have to give credit to a former candidate in this uh, race, Catherine Bernard, for actually leading the charge on educating the people of Brookhaven exactly what the redevelopment powers law meant for the people of Brookhaven. Uh, and in doing so, again, 60% of the people rejected that. Uh, and that to me is a very, you know, that's a very clear sign of what our democratic process, uh, you know, allows us to, uh, to accomplish. Uh, but again, this goes back to uh, the transparency and the openness, uh, you know, of our government uh, to inform the voters on exactly what they're getting into before we go uh, you know, blindly into the night on something that could otherwise affect us uh, adversely years down the road. And that's exactly what happened here with the redevelopment power laws. Sorry, we're short, we're short of mic. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, in, in similar lines as far as uh, uh, economic development and um, municipalization is concerned, given the rapid growth and the uh, propensity for higher density development in, uh, in HD80, how do you address concerns regarding the effect on the community's green space, pollution, and traffic? I believe that transportation is one of the most 
vital necessities for any society. Uh, you have to have workable transportation solutions uh, for communities to even operate. Um, you know, over the past couple of decades in Georgia, we have not really taken uh, really a powerful approach at addressing our transportation concerns. Uh, one of the most exciting recent things a lot of you have probably heard is the, the MARTA uh, expansion proposal that's out. It's $8 billion expansion. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for something like that for a long time. And what that's going to be able to do is connect areas of our, of our metro city area together that otherwise uh, didn't have a uh, connection to them. You know, like if you kind of look at, you know, the MARTA track, it's a big circle, and uh, we're at 285, and there's like a, a MARTA line in the middle. We're going to start putting spokes on that wheel, and that's exactly what we need. And that's the kind of thinking that we need uh, at the state level. Uh, one of the things that we have really under underperformed on is funding transportation. Uh, this year we passed H. Bill 170, uh, and, and basically what that did, though, was fund transportation up to the maintenance levels. So we didn't actually fund anything beyond that. Uh, and so that just really took care of what was already the existing infrastructure. But as everybody in this room knows, uh, you know, especially in our district alone, uh, transportation is a, is a very serious issue. I don't like sitting on Ashford Dunwoody for 45 minutes to get a gallon of milk like anybody else. Every minute that we spend in traffic is a minute we're not at work being productive or at home with our families. And we have to have uh, forward-thinking initiatives to do that, but we also have to have the funding to back up those initiatives. And uh, as your state legislator, I, I will champion legislation and champion funding initiatives to bring that kind of uh, those, those kinds of uh, solutions to our district. There's tons of money out there for us at the federal level and the regional level that we can uh, that we can bring back into our district uh, to facilitate the, the needs that we have in the transportation area. Um, and so, as your legislator, I promise that I will bring those kinds of initiatives to us. Well, um, that's. Uh Marta, Marta is interesting, but I would like to talk about what I did as actually with my record as mayor to help with transportation and traffic in our community. Uh, the first thing I did, a very big champion of this, was expanding sidewalks and building sidewalks and repairing sidewalks. The first thing we did uh, at, at, when our public works department got online was look at schools, the sidewalks around and in front of schools. So we repaired those sidewalks first so that children can actually walk to school safely without worrying about having to step in a crack or fall down and a, and a mom to get a stroller across our sidewalks. We, we addressed all the sidewalks around the schools, number one. Then number two, we started looking at linking areas in the city that did have, had no sidewalk previously. We did that on Ashford Dome near Stratfield Drive and uh, uh, the, it was about a 100 yard stretch of sidewalk that linked the top of the city to the bottom of the city. Right now, before you couldn't do this, but now you can walk from the top of Brookhaven near the hospitals down to Beaufort Highway on a sidewalk. Before, you couldn't do that. We filled in gaps, miles of new sidewalks. So that's how you can eliminate some car trips is by getting people, making the city walkable. I've done that as mayor. The second thing we did was make sure that our roads were paved and that people could not have to have, you know, potholes that tore up their front ends. And another thing we did with, with the streets, when you talked about sitting on Ashford Dunwoody for 45 minutes, now you can sit on Ashford Dunwoody for about 15 minutes because we, we as the city of Brookhaven, fixed the intersection of, of Ashford Dunwoody and Johnson's Ferry. We cut wait times down by 40%. All we did was restripe the intersection and time the signals. It didn't cost a lot of money. So I know we want, funding is important for transportation, but I look at accountability and efficiency first. Before we start asking the taxpayers for more money, the MARTA $8 billion plan is a half cent tax increase for DeKalb and Fulton and Clayton counties. I don't know if you knew that. but. I want to make sure that MARTA, I ride MARTA, I love driving, I love riding down MARTA going across 85 and seeing that traffic backed up when I'm going downtown. It's a great feeling to know I'm on a train that's cool and going and nice and air conditioned and going down to the Capitol or to, to, to court. Uh, the thing about MARTA though is in order to expand MARTA, you've got to fix MARTA first. MARTA is on a path towards being fixed. We have to make sure it's cleaner safer and the trains run more efficiently. Now Keith Parker has done a good job with some of those issues but he's not there yet but Marta's already asking for another eight billion dollars out of your pocket. Before we let Marta expand we've got to make sure Marta is working to its fullest potential and that people, the ridership goes up because you address all those issues. It might be that way in a year or two so that we can look at hey Marta might need to be, expand. They're running things properly. Marta has a horrible history of mismanagement and un, and wasting money. So I'm not one of these guys that says throw money at the problem. I'm saying let's get accountability, fix it first, then we'll look at giving you some money to expand. 
There was a uh, special commission appointed by our interim CEO, Lee Mae, to uh, do some um, investigations into some of the ethics that were going on in DeKalb County, and the gentleman's name is Mike Bowers, Special Investigator Mike Bowers, and his quote was, and I believe it was posted in the post today, the DeKalb County government we have found is rotten to the core. That was, I mean, I couldn't believe he said that when he said that, but it's in print, and you, and it's, you know, I think we've all heard a little bit of that here. We may have actually experienced some of that. So we've heard some discussion about transparency. Obviously, ethics are very important. As voters, you want to elect a representative that is going to operate their office with full transparency and with the highest ethical standards. So um, obviously, you both expressed that in your, in your um, campaign uh, discussions. What specific policies, however, specifically, will you implement during your term to gain and maintain the confidence of the residents of your district? I'll tell you some things that I did as mayor. One of the first things I did was have a door built without an office that said, welcome, come on in. And the reason I did that because it was because I wanted to start Mondays with the mayor. We had hundreds of citizens utilize Mondays with the mayor, where any citizen in the city of Brookhaven could call up the day of, make an appointment, and, and sit down and tell me what's bothering them or what they're happy about in the city of Brookhaven for 30 minutes. No vendors, no contractors, no lawyers, unless they're a city of Brookhaven lawyer, and they're wanting to talk about their streets and their crosswalks they didn't have before we became a city. That's as, as about as open as you can be. Another thing that I did as mayor, when I ran for mayor, I put my cell phone number on every piece of literature I mailed out, and as mayor, I promoted my cell, cell phone number to every citizen. I'm doing that now. Everything that I put out has my cell phone number on it. People use it. They call me. Sometimes they call me and just, is this really even? They hang up because they're amazed that a, a public official would have their cell phone so readily available. I know Trump's been publishing some cell phones, but I was the first guy to actually publish my own cell phone. Um, and another thing uh, is the uh, open records law. There is a provision in the open records law that says privacy can be used to uh, withhold documents or to withhold information. I think the open records law needs to be amended. That's a specific proposal I proposed about six weeks ago that would strike or eliminate or narrow the privacy exception in the open records law. That would eliminate all kinds of problems. That means if you're a government employee or a government official, there's nothing that can't get out there if you've done it on a government computer or done it on your time while you're at City Hall or down at the Capitol or up in Congress. So that's a specific proposal that I've put out there and I think that that would go a long way to making sure that people have a clear understanding before going into public service or working for government that everything they do is going to be out there for the public to see. So those are the things that I have done and will do to continue promoting ethics and transparency in the state legislature and the state of Georgia. Uh, at a very young age, my parents instilled in me uh, two very fundamental principles, and that's responsibility and accountability. Uh, and I think that those two fundamental principles carry on to what we would do as legislators and as policymakers and elected officials. Ethics and transparency uh, you know, are the foundations upon which representative governments exist. Uh, I think it's important uh, to not lose sight of that. And I think that at any level of the government, whether you're from the governor's office to the state representatives to the mayors and the council members of the municipalities, everyone should be held accountable for their actions. Um, as a lot of you know, I've recently come under uh, a little bit of fire for a, an ethical complaint that was filed against me for, uh, you know, the, the, I forgot to file my personal disclosures uh, with the Finance Commission. Uh, I thought that that paper was filed back in May, but it wasn't. Uh, but within about 30 minutes of that hitting the wires, um, we immediately filed it, and I, and I took responsibility for my actions. And I think that that's exactly what leadership is about, is being able to admit your mistakes uh, and take accountability for the things that you do while you're in office and, and making sure that the people understand that you weren't, uh, that you, you had the best interests of the people at heart the entire time and that you weren't trying to hide anything uh, and doing what you were called on doing. Uh, so to me, that's really what leadership is about. Uh, and as your state legislator, I will absolutely make sure that ethics, uh, transparency, and accountability uh, are, are at the for forefront of, of, of how I lead us. Thank you. But this uh, next topic is more of a, of a national concern, but it has very, uh, it, it hits very home here in, in this district, especially in, in uh, 
HD80, and that has a lot to do with uh, the influx of uh, immigrants coming to our country. So there is a um, something called DACA, which is the is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is a uh, a national uh, bill, if I'm not mistaken, that talks about delaying the deportation of uh, children who come to this state so that they can finish their educations before they are forced to be sent back to their home countries. So um, the reason why I think it's important is you know you go you you drive through these streets you look around you there's a lot of, there's a lot of diversity here. So the question we would like to pose specifically to the candidates is you know what is your opinion on providing in-state tuition at Georgia public colleges and universities for recipients of DACA? Uh, I think you said it best. District 80 is home to a very diverse community. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to be very proud of. Uh, I think that the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia uh, you know, is, is a really popular destination uh, for immigrants coming into the United States uh, because of the economic opportunities that we've created here. Uh, and as it specifically relates to DACA, you know, the legislation uh, is, is a wonderful piece of legislation that really champions uh, and, and celebrates uh, you know, a, a child's you know, or matriculation through our education system. And I think that that's very important to remember is that you know, this is an opportunity uh, you know, in these situations for children who otherwise don't have access uh, to the opportunities that, that a lot of Americans have uh, in our education system. And they can go through our education system and then become uh, a part of society and have meaningful impacts, uh, you know, in their everyday lives. And I think in that process, you know, although this is a very national issue uh, and it's something that the states have a limited role in, there is a lot that the states can do to help facilitate, um, you know, the conversation and progress in the right direction uh, with this issue. Uh, I believe that, you know, when we create mechanisms for people to have a responsible path to citizenship. Uh, that allow them to have access you know, to the opportunities that we all have here uh, is a wonderful thing. This is a country that was founded by immigrants. So we need to celebrate that. Uh, and and you know, again, this is a federal issue, but you know, as a state legislator, I, I will be involved as much as I can uh, at championing those types of initiatives to create the opportunities for people who otherwise uh, don't have those opportunities in their homes. So um, I hope that answers that. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, and that's, this is a good question because it does, it gives people a stark choice between philosophies on government. I absolutely do not think that we should be providing in-state tuition to children of illegal immigrants. I think that there are children in Georgia who are being denied opportunity right now who are citizens whose parents pay property taxes. And you talk about funding for education, you want to start funding folks whose, whose are, are families are not American citizens before you address the issue of our rising college tuition, hope scholarships in trouble, and we want to talk about adding a whole other class of people to get in-state tuition. I mean, what can we, let's, let's fix our problem first. Let's look out for our own citizens' children first. I think that's important. Now, Brookhaven is a diverse city. I love the diversity we have in Brookhaven, and I've actually done things to help the immigrant community, whether they're legal or not. We never, our police don't ask that question. And what we did, I, one of the first things as mayor that I did, I went down to Cross Keys High School and Woodward Elementary and met with the parents of children, the Hispanic parents and children of those two schools, just to build trust between this new government, who they were very suspicious of because they were not very, there's no, no confidence or trust between DeKalb police and this community. Let me tell you, I heard a lot of stories about that, about being intimidated in their own apartment complexes when they would gripe about a, uh, you know, a problem with, with sewer running down their walls or a hole in their floor and being told by, by someone, a DeKalb official, you be quiet or we're going to call INS. So it took, well, there was a lot of broken trust in this city when it came to our immigrant community. But we worked at it. We worked at it. We went down there. We had interpreters. We talked to folks. We brought our police department down there. They met our chief. We started bringing school supplies to those kids. They understood that a Brookhaven police officer was somebody they could go tug on the collar and say, hey, something bad is happening over here. Whereas before, they wouldn't. And the moms were wonderful. The moms were the backbone of that community, and they were the first ones to come up. They start smiling. They start speaking. They want to take pictures because they, they're, they're refreshed that there's a local government that they can actually trust and depend on to provide them security. Because they live in Brookhaven, and we owe a duty to them. But when it comes to a federal legislation to look out for illegal immigrants, 
and their educational choices and their educational costs, I think we really are putting the cart before the horse when we haven't addressed the issues for our own kids and the, with the rising cost of college and the problems with Hope Scholarships. Thank you, gentlemen. So, 33% of the voters in the uh, district did not vote for either one of you in the last, in the, in the primary. So that is a fairly sizable population. How do you anticipate uh, encouraging them to vote for them, or to vote for you? Um, if this is your opportunity, what, do you, what would you like to say to those 33% that to convince them to vote for you? Hey, is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been talking to a lot of them, and a lot of them are very excited about a new city school system. Independents, Democrats, Republicans, all are excited about that, most for the most part. But another thing that hasn't been mentioned or our question hasn't been asked on are property taxes. It's a huge issue here with the recent assessment boost the county's been putting on, our, on the backs of our homeowners and our families. People on fixed incomes, seniors, calling me in tears, I'm not trying to be a, emotional about this, about how I'm going to have to sell my home because the county raised my taxes $5,000 this year. They raise your taxes without a vote. It's a backdoor tax increase. That's why my bill to cap property taxes, I know you're, you're, you don't think that we can do that and still have education, but the problem, again, is not funded. DeKalb County's got too much money. It's time to turn off the spigot. I mean, it's rotten to the core. You want to keep fit, fit, feeding money to a system that's rotten to the core? I know the chief of staff, the former chief of staff of Vernon Jones and Braille Ellis support you and contribute to your campaign. If we want to keep that, that kind of uh, methodology going, you should vote for my opponent. But it's, it's really important that we understand that property taxes are out of control in DeKalb County. My plan would cap property taxes at 3%, your actual bill, not your assessment. Your assessment would kick in with the new home, when you sell your home to, the, to a new homeowner. 3% cap on your property taxes or the consumer price index, whichever is less. That way, when you go to your mailbox, instead of waiting with bated breath or trembling, what's my assessment going to be every spring? You know, hey, they can't go up more than 3%. Not 40, 50, 100 percent. I've talked to a lady who's went from four thousand dollars to eight thousand dollars in one year. Is that fair or right? Should we be giving DeKalb County the benefit of the doubt when it comes to how they're assessing our homes and raising our taxes? No, we shouldn't. We've got a government by indictment in DeKalb County. And the DeKalb County political machine supports my opponent. If you want more of that, Taylor's a nice guy and a good guy, but the people who are wanting him to win don't have your best interests at heart. It's the same old, same old. The status quo. I want to make sure we do something different, whether it's education or property taxes. The Cap County's got to change. The school system's got to change. And I'm sorry, but the folks who run and control the Cap County are behind my opponent. They're not behind me. They've been against me since I started thinking about cityhood. They don't want it to happen. They don't want me in there under any stretch of the imagination. Mark my words. Just they do not want J. Max Davis as House or State Legislator from District 80. They want Taylor Bennett. The Cab County government and political machine wants Taylor Bennett. And that's a stark contrast, I know. But it's a very important distinction. Because if you want to have certainty when it comes to your property taxes, if you want to, if you want to see the Cab CEO position eliminated, if you want to see continued progress when it comes to these cities that we're forming, then you need to vote for me on August 11th. And that's what I've been talking to independents about. That's how I'm getting their votes. Because they understand how important, when, they, when I come to the door and they show me the property tax bill, and they show me the previous years, they understand. Well, I think you did say it best. The people of DeKalb County do want me in office because I am the best option for this job. But the, to answer your question specifically as it relates to independent voters, you know, I, I just want to encourage people to go look at the facts. Uh, my opponent has sat up here and said that he did not raise property taxes one time, but for the past three years, public notices have gone out to each and every person in Brookhaven announcing a property tax increase. And the reason that happened is because there was not a full rollback on the millage rate. It was a backdoor tax, as you put it. So I want to get back to, I've had the opportunity to connect with a lot of people in this campaign, Democrats, Republicans, a lot of independents. Libertarians. There's a lot of people. We have a diverse political spectrum here in our, in our district. 
And that's been the most rewarding thing, is being able to connect with everybody on whatever issue it is that's important to them. And that's something that I encourage everybody to do. Find an issue and see where we can connect. And then you'll be able to make an informed decision based on the facts and not have to listen to vacant rhetoric about this fallacies about I want status quo and that these corrupt people want me in office because it's completely false. I'm here to do a good job for you. I'm here to give you the best type of leadership you can have. And I'm here to take District 80 into the future. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, we're, we're doing very good on time here. Five minutes. We have 10 minutes, so I think what we might do is we'll, we'll ask this question and then we'll uh, give you an opportunity for some closing comments and then we'll end right at 8. Fair enough? Okay. So um, tell us something that one of your coaches or your mentors, you guys both played sports, tell us something that one of your coaches or mentors said to you that really stuck with you over the years. I just remember the coach always telling me, don't throw interceptions. That's all I remember doing. And unfortunately, I did a lot of that. But, um, you know, a lot of coaches said a lot of great things uh, over the years. Uh, but the one coach, you know, that I really have to tip my hat to is my mother. She's been my life coach since I was born. Uh, my sister and I were raised, you know, by a single mother. And so, you know, I watched what she was able to do uh, professionally. And then what she was able to do as a mother for my sister and I. And the one thing that she always told me, Taylor, she said, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And what I, you know, when you're eight years old, you have no idea what that means. Uh, but when you grow up, you start to realize that uh, you have to actually go out and do the things uh, you know, to, to bring the luck to you. Uh, and when you prepare for something and you see an opportunity, you have to go seize it. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done in this situation. None of y'all in this room had heard of me until May, until we announced for this election. And I got a bunch of family and friends together, and we said, you know, we can go out there and do this. And we hit over 10,000 doors in about 30 days in the first half of this election. And we're going to hit about 12,000 doors because we need to connect with every single one of you as much as, much as we can. And that's what this is all about. It's about, uh, you know, Seizing an opportunity that's right in front of you, putting a team together and going and getting the job done. Because that's what it's about. You know, I've heard a lot of I, I, I tonight. But this is about us. And this is about we. We come together to go do the things that we want to do as a community, as we want to do as a state. And that, to me, is really what all this is about. It's about us being together and going and solving our problems. Thank you, Terry. I would uh, say, um, probably on the field advice was don't fumble Davis. I heard, I heard that one from Coach Dooley at, at EGA. Um, you know, I, I've had a lot of coaches. I went to Shambly High School, had coaches there telling me I got to have a heart from chest bone to chest bone in order to get things done. You got to leave it all on the field. Don't give 110%, all those things that Taylor and I both know about that you hear screamed on the football field. And I guess, you know, uh, much similar to his mother, my father was actually a, a football coach. He, was a, he played professional football for the Kansas City Chiefs, and he served this state and this community and, and, house, uh, and the state house representatives from 1980 until he passed away in 2002. And what he told me, which was the most important thing to me, was don't ever tolerate a liar. And the, the worst thing you could do in my house growing up was tell a lie. You could break the crystal chandelier you could leave your tra you leave your plates on the table, but don't ever tell a lie. Your name is the only thing that you have that nobody can take away from it unless you give it to them. So to me, honesty and integrity is the foundation of everything that I do. You have to have a moral compass in your head when you decide when somebody offers you something that you know is not right. You have to have that innate ability that's been ingrained in you by your parents and family that you'll do what's right when no one's looking. Uh, so my father was a fine example. He stood up. When he was one in the state house, there were 12 Republicans and 158 Democrats. And my father uh, showed his independence by voting no just about on everything in his first few years in office. And because Tom Murphy ran that, ran that uh, chamber like a, a dictator, uh, not a benevolent dictator either, uh, he was always able, he voted against the budget, and sooner or later, Every year he would vote against the budget. People say, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? But because there, there are things in there that taxpayers don't know about and because they're increasing your taxes and there's no accountability. It's a good old boy system down here. And he would get, 
you know, railed at by some of his colleagues, even some Republicans. But sooner or later, those red dots on the board began to grow. And people began to stand up to the speaker and began to stand up for the citizens of the state, stand up for Georgia, and stand up for his constituents. So I learned lots of great lessons from my father, constituent services, making sure you voted with your conscience, reading bills before they get passed, making sure that, you know, when you, I remember growing up, when the phone rang with my, a question from a citizen from my father, and it, invariably it wasn't about a question he could do anything about as a state legislator, invariably it was, my DeKalb County water bill is out of whack. I can't get this permit from DeKalb County. It was DeKalb County problems that my father was solving day in and day out. It wasn't really state legislative problems, it was DeKalb County problems. And I know that some of you here are still think that DeKalb County is a good and benevolent government, but I'm here to tell you, DeKalb County is rotten to the core when it comes to their government. And I'm gonna be one that you can count among me, I'm gonna be one standing up and pointing that out when it needs to be pointed out. And so that's what my father instilled in me as, as a life coach was always do what's right, don't back down, don't be a bomb thrower, but make sure people know where you stand. And when people can look at me or look at my dad, when they looked at my dad, you always know where Max Davis stands. You don't have to guess or worry. And if I can fill one-tenth of his shoe, I'll be a success, believe me. So, I, again, I thank you for your uh, attention, and again, I ask for your vote on August 11th. Folks, let's have a hand for the candidates. More so because we're finishing a little bit early, but I am going to give the candidates an opportunity to provide some closing remarks if there's something they didn't get a chance to say since we did end our, our ending a little bit early. So you can each have three minutes. Fair enough. You guys can tolerate that. Is that all right? So since two minutes, two minutes each. So one minute closing remarks. Anything you want to say? Anything nice? Tell a joke. I'll one minute. Just again, I really want to just thank everybody for coming out again. We've tried to set this up for so long in this election. It feels like I've been in this for 18 months. We've only been there for about 70 something days. But uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, more of this type of dialogue and discussion needs to happen uh, in these types of things because it's the only way that we, we get full, you know, uh, activity from the, uh, from the community in, in elections. And so I really appreciate Rick and Todd and, and Terrell and, and everybody for putting this on. This has been uh, a phenomenal opportunity for all of us. So thank you for coming out. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Todd, and the Chamber. Uh, thank you again, all, all of you, for coming out. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate that, you know, my motivations and reasons for wanting to take my next step in public service into the state legislature is because I care about our community. I was born here. My family's raised here. My wife grew up on East Nancy Creek. I grew up on West Nancy Creek. She went to Marist. I went to Shamley. We're invested in this community. We're not going anywhere. And I, I just want people to know, my motivation is to leave something better here than when I got here. And that's what City of Brookhaven is about. When I see those paved roads and I see those sidewalks, when I see children swimming in the nice, safe, clean pools, when I see the playgrounds, when I see that Brookhaven police car. I mean, how many of you enjoy seeing a Brookhaven police car? I hear many times, raise your hand if you're, you're excited about the Brookhaven police. If you're not excited about the work, please keep your hands down. It's, it's, it's an, yes, both hands. I mean, I, I hear from officers just the other day, officers still get a round of applause when they walk into a restaurant in the city of Brookhaven. They love our citizens because we have the best citizens in the state of Georgia. Sandy Springs is a close second, and Shannon is a close second and a half. It's, it's important that we keep that rolling. District 80 is about 80% Brookhaven, 15% Sandy Springs, 15, 5% Shamblin. And my motivation is to, is to build on, this, on the successes we have with this city and to let my children and your children and your grandchildren and your families live in a safe, secure city, an environment and district that uh, you can be proud of. So I'm proud of you. J. Max Davis, August 11th. Thank you very much. Thank you, candidates. One of these men will be representing you in five days, so I encourage you to get out and vote. We will have a new uh, HD80 representative on Tuesday. Encourage your friends to vote. Everyone, thank you so much for coming out. Thanks to Oglethorpe University. And uh, stay home, everyone. Thank you.